Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. I hope you've had a, a couple of minutes to review the welcome to our webinar slide. We've got some uh, instructions or housekeeping uh, issues to, to review. Obviously, you know you've been muted upon entry. You do have a control bar at the bottom of your screen that will enable you to open the chat box. And we are asking that you post your questions in the chat box and they will go to both to us and to the panelists. I'll be able to see those. Um, we've uh, enabled live transcript. So if you need, if you like captioning across your screen, you can click on live transcript and open that. We've disabled Q and A. Many of you have joined us before, and um, that's not a feature that we are using today. Please know that note that a certificate of attendance. There'll be a link that will be provided at the conclusion of the webinar after you've you know migrated away from our presentation. And please note that all participants' emails or addresses will be shared with the presenters in order that they might be able to share future updates with you about this uh, particular topic. Okay. At this time, I would like to hand the presentation over to um, Dr. Don McGrath with InSource and Kim Dodson with the Arc of Indiana. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I'm Don McGrath, Executive Director for InSource. The Educational Scholarship Account team has been working diligently with state leaders to provide a program for parents and children with special education eligibility who have the capacity to manage their children's educational program. We are grateful that this team has taken the time today to explain the vision and the details on how to participate. Also, a sincere thank you to Dr. Nancy Holsapel and Brad Pendleton for helping us understand how this new program fits into the provisions of Article 7. I'd like to turn this over to Kim Dotson, who will introduce the speakers and make a few remarks. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. McGrath, and welcome everybody this afternoon. Very glad that you have made the decision to join us. I think a lot of you are um, aware that in 2021, the Indiana General Assembly did pass a piece of legislation that allowed for Indiana to offer Indiana scholarship accounts, education scholarship accounts, to families who had a student receiving special education services. And we are glad that the state of Indiana wanted to provide other choices uh, to families who were not um, completely satisfied with the education that they were receiving um, and wanted to provide an option for them to create a new type of, of education for their student. However, I think that um, the education scholarship accounts are complex. And so um, I'm really happy that in source, Dr. McGrath specifically uh, wanted to work with us to make this webinar available to you. We have been extremely pleased with the group of individuals that have come together to help implement um, this program. And a very special thank you to the state treasurer's office um, and, and Jackie, as she has joined that team as executive director. Uh, we always are extremely appreciative of the partnership we have with the State Department of Education and specifically with our special education director. Um, it is my pleasure that we were able to bring together um, this group of individuals today to, again, provide an overview of education scholarship accounts and provide some really good information and answer questions regarding this important program. Uh, first, we have with us Dr. Nancy Halsapple, Director of Special Education for the Indiana Department of Education. Dr. Halsapple, we appreciate all you do each and every day uh, for Hoosiers who are receiving special education services. Um, and then we also have with us Brad Pendleton, who is the Assistant Director of the Indiana Non-Public Schools. So Nancy, I wanna turn it over to you. And again, just wanna say thank you both for being with us this afternoon. Well, thank you, Kim. Um, as Kim and Dawn both said, we are going to share with you today information about the education scholarship accounts. And I am going to share from the perspective at the Department of Ed. So let me share my screen. Can everyone, <clears throat> can you see the slideshow? Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, what we're going to talk about, or I'm going to share with you, are the procedural regulations for special education. So 
Indiana has Article 7, and through Article 7, it references child fine. So that is a term that is required by IDEA that each public school conducts a, a, what they refer to as a, as a child fine. So this is when students with um, possible disabilities, parents agree to have an evaluation, education evaluation completed through the public school in order to qualify for the ESA, this has to start in the public schools. Article 7, Rule 40 describes the steps that must be taken for schools for a student to be eligible. The timeline, this is important as well. So the parent or the public schools make a referral for an evaluation. The schools provide the written notice that is proposing that they are going to evaluate or they are refusing to evaluate, including its description of the evaluation process. If the notice is in response to a parent's request for an evaluation, then the written notice must be provided within 10 instructional days of the parent's request for the evaluation. <clears throat> parent must provide the written consent before the school can proceed with the education evaluation. So we have to public schools, charters, if you know your child attends, you have to have your written permission in place before the evaluation can be conducted. So the school personnel completes the evaluation and then a case conference committee is convened to determine the student's eligibility. This is a 50 instructional day timeline once the schools receive the parent's request. And then the parent must make the student accessible to the school for the education evaluation to be completed. During that case conference meeting, the, the uh, decisions of eligibility and services are determined by the case conference. Those in attendance must include the parent, the public agency rep, a general education teacher, a special educational teacher, and then the professional who can explain the results of the evaluation and instructional implications. That's typically a school psychologist, but a speech therapist also conducts their own evaluation. So that person would be the uh, professional speaking on part of the speech language assessment. There are two prompt requirement for eligibility. So one is <clears throat> the student has a disability as defined in Article 7 under one of the 13 disabilities. I say one because you have one primary, but speech language can be considered as secondary. Then there also has to be documentation that the disability adversely affects the educational performance. So the state has a system as of distributing funding to schools based on the severity of the disability and it's called additional pupil count or APC dollars. It is this funding structure as well as state tuition support that will be used to determine how much is available in an ESA. At that time of the conference, the school must be, or I'm sorry, the school must offer the parents an individualized education program. We refer to it as an IEP. Then the school must finalize the IEP and provide the parents with an offer of FAPE, free appropriate public education. Within that IEP is a proposed set of goals, services, and placement options in the public school system. To be eligible for an ESA, the parents refuse the offer of FAPE, and then the school offers a service plan. 
this is often done when students are um, homeschooled or attend a private school. They are given a service plan. So when the service plan, the components of it, it is fewer components than what is in an IEP, but it should state a statement of the student's present levels of educational performance, a statement of measurable annual goals related to the services that we'll be providing, describing what the student can be expected to accomplish within a 12 month period. And the reason why the 12 month period is an IEP or a service plan cannot go longer than 12 months. When you get close to your 12 month period, then the school will reconvene a case conference to update the IEP or service plan. Also within the service plan is a statement of the special education and related services, supplementary aids and services to be provided to the student or on behalf of the student by the public agency or the supports for school personnel that will be provided. Continuing with the service plan, if applicable, a statement regarding the student's partic participation in statewide or district assessments, including any documentation of appropriate testing accommodations that are that would be utilized by the students according to the requirements of Article 7. With the ESA, all students are still required to be assessed on the state assessment. The projected dates for initiation of services by the public agency, the anticipated link, the frequency, the location, and the duration of services. Again, this is a 12 month period. Included in the service plan is a statement of the student's progress toward the annual goals, including how the parents will be informed of the progress. <clears throat> Within the ESA education service plan, so if the IEP is offered, parents decline, a service plan is offered, and the parents decline, and then in order to have an ESA, the parent has to refuse both of those. So if the parent declines the offer of special education and related service under the service plan, then it becomes what we are referring to as an ESA education service plan. Unless the case conference committee identifies other needs, goals, or services to be included, then it would be based off of the information in the last service plan that's offered. The pair is responsible to pay for and arrange for the provisions of special education and related services that are identified in the ESA education service plan. So it's a little bit of confusing. So you start out with your IEP, parents decline FAPE, then the school offers a service plan. And within that service plan, it covers the information I just shared. And then parents decline that. And then the third option is referred to as the education service plan. <laughs> so things to remember. So you're starting with an initial evaluation. So any student who, um, the parent wants to consider for an ESA must be a student identified with a disability. And remember that is a 50 instructional day timeline to complete the assessment. And that is after the school obtains the parent's written permission. You also need to know that reevaluations are done every three years. So you need to make sure your information is current if your child is already in the special education system and you decide you want to pursue the service plan of the ESA option. Also, if you're um, moving to Indiana from another state, 
the law says that we must, when I say we public schools must hold what is referred to as a move in conference within the public school of legal settlement. So wherever you reside, if you're moving to Indiana, you have to find what that public school is, request a move in conference. The conference will be held and the, the process will, uh, will occur. Like I said, the school will offer you an IEP service plan and then an ESA, but you still have to be within a public school. And that's what I have to share. And I'm going to quit sharing if I can. Well, thank you, Dr. Holzapple. And one, I mean, that is a lot of information and I think you presented it very well and did it very succinctly. I know we get a lot of questions here at the ART about what does it exactly mean? The number one question we get is, do I have to give up FAPE? So thank you very much for putting that very clearly um, in the slides that yes, you do have to um, give up um, your offer of FAPE for you to participate with an education scholarship account. So um, I am now going to turn this over to uh, Jackie, Jackie Guamo, who is the um, executive director of the Indiana Education Scholarship Account Program for the treasurer of the state of Indiana's office. And Jackie is pretty new on the scene. So she came to us from another state, uh, but fortunately um, the treasurer's office was able to snag her to head up this program. I think it's really nice when you get somebody in a position um, that has some knowledge about special education. Um, she certainly has a heart uh, for making sure that students with disabilities get access to the services that they need to be successful. And so, Jackie, welcome to um, the, the webinar. Thank you for everything that you are doing. And it's been a real pleasure getting to know you and working so closely with you. And I'm going to turn it over to you to go through your presentation. Thank you so much, Kim. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you to the ARC and to InSource for hosting this webinar for us. I'm so excited to be able to share this information um, with everybody about the Education Scholarship Account Program. Um, and of course, a huge thank you to Department of Ed. We've worked so closely with them in gathering this information um, and building out the program really from the ground up. So with that, I'll get right to it. Um, we have a QR code here in the corner. Um, you can scan that at any time and that will lead you right to our website, our landing page um, for the Education Scholarship Account Program. Right on that main landing page, you'll see two links that you can click, one that will lead you to information that's more specific to parents and another that will lead you to information that's more specific to providers. Um, if you also scroll down at the bottom of that landing page, you'll learn more about our upcoming events, um, panel discussions, and uh, holding around the, the state right now, um, coming to you live from Evansville. So <laughs> this is a new area for me, um, but also my contact information is on there as well. So please feel free to reach out with any questions. So um, as Kim introduced, I'm Jackie Guillermo. Um, I'm so excited to introduce you to our program, um, but I'm gonna begin with a little bit of an introduction to our team. Um, we do have a four person team right now. We're looking to expand um, in the near future as our application window will begin to open up um, and we'll need some more um, staff internally to um, help us on the, on the inside with the program. So we'll start with me. Um, I have a bachelor in public policy and law. Um, and as Kim referenced, I do have some experience in the field, which makes me really excited to bring this program to the state of Indiana. Um, I was a special education teacher in New York for a few years. Um, when I started working in the field of intellectual and developmental disabilities, specifically with adults, and became a board certified behavior analyst. I then moved to Massachusetts, um, where I worked for the Boston Public School System and was in charge of special education for five elementary schools. So um, I definitely worked in a lot of different spaces with a lot of families, attended countless IEP meetings, and um, really have an understanding for how this can benefit our families. Um, Ryan Locke is our Deputy Treasurer of State. Um, he really shouldered the program um, from the time that the bill passed up until my coming on board about five months ago um, and still very involved in the process internally. 
And over the past um, couple of months, um, since December, we've brought on two new members of our team. Um, one is Chris Vodder. He's our deputy general counsel. And in addition to uh, being a wonderful asset as an attorney, he was also a former teacher um, and does a lot of volunteer work and coaching, um, has worked with students with disabilities. And, and we really appreciated that about him. And we're excited to bring him on board, um, having an understanding in that space. And we also have Emma Weiss, who's our program coordinator, who's also brought on in December. Um, and in addition to her also being a teacher, she comes to us from the um, Indiana Professional Licensing Agency. So she's been able to offer a lot of insight um, and guidance for us in vetting um, providers internally and making sure that they have the proper license and accreditation to support our families in the program. So my presentation is um, broken up into four different um, categories. Uh, first, I'm gonna go through an overview of the program, then we'll dive a bit deeper into student eligibility, participating providers, and then qualified expenses. So things that are allowable um, to spend on under our program. Um, so you'll see that my presentation is built kind of in a Q&A format, and I find that that um, it makes the um, information a little bit more consumable, so bear with me here. So first and foremost, what is the ESA program about? Um, so the Indiana ESA was established in 2021, as Kim referenced, um, and we're projected to launch in the 2022-23 school year. Our program is administered by the Treasurer of State, um, and it's just another wonderful option of school choice in the state of Indiana. Our mission um, in, for the ESA program is to provide Indiana students with disabilities scholarship money that can be used for pre-approved programs that have an educational focus. Um, so really, this is a wonderful program where families can customize the education that their student is going to receive through therapies um, and educational services. Um, a question that I receive quite often is, can this be used with other scholarships? And the wonderful thing about our program being a scholarship program is that it cannot be counted as income for the family. Um, and therefore, an ESA, accepting an ESA and being awarded an ESA will not compromise your ability to use other forms of financial aid or even Medicaid waiver services. Um, the only type of scholarship that a student would not be able to use concurrent to an ESA would be the Choice Scholarship Program. Um, a little bit more detail about how ESA overlaps with Medicaid waiver. So really first and foremost, I do want to encourage families who are utilizing waiver services to contact their case manager um, and get a deeper understanding of the waiver that they're qualifying for and using and what services are eligible under that waiver to really be able to maximize both, um, both funding sources fully. But overall, the ESA, um, as I mentioned, is much more focused on educational expenses, where for the most part, Medicaid waiver tends to be more focused on medical expenses. So um, we do have an informational graphic that will go up on our website about um, how Medicaid waiver um, relates to us, but please contact your case manager um, and have, a, have our list of qualified expenses ready. Um, will my student need to reapply every year? Yes. So students will need to show proof that they're meeting the eligibility requirements on an annual basis. And I will go through those more in depth when I touch on student eligibility. Um, going forward, preference is going to be given to students who are account holders. So what that means is in the 23-24 school year, we're going to be reviewing renewal documentation. So any account holder who does want to continue utilizing the ESA prior to bringing in new accounts. Um, how much funding is provided to my student, right? Big um, question. And thank you, Dr. Holsapel, for touching on this in your presentation as well. It's always good to have that um, reiteration of this information because it's so important. Our um, ESA grant awards are based on two main components. First is the amount of tuition support that's provided by the school district that your student would be going to, that public school corporation. So just like the Choice Scholarship Program, our award is 90% of that tuition support. In addition, as Dr. Holtzapel referenced, there's APC or additional pupil count funding, which are the special education dollars that are allotted to a student based on the category of their disability. Um, and so I have a slide to share about that. So here are some figures from the 2021-22 school year. Um, and again, as Dr. Holsapple referenced, a student can qualify for any of these as a primary and level three as a secondary. So 
um, quite a bit of money there. Now, APC funding um, would be placed into the grant award if a family is choosing to pursue special education services on their own. Um, what we're offering to families is if a student is choosing to go to a qualified school here in Indiana, so an accredited school, um, we would prioritize that payment of the APC dollars to that school for the student um, since they would be the provider of the special education. Is there a limit of how many students can receive an ASA? For this first year, yes, there is a limit since we are capped on the number of funds or the amount of funds that we may distribute. Um, we anticipate an approximate of 1,000 students, but it really is hard to tell because um, as you see of the two components that comprise the award amount, um, the award amount for every student is going to be different and can vary quite variably. So um, it's really going to depend on the students that apply, um, how much their awards are going to be is how many students that we would be able to support this first year. Um, and I, I always kind of put a plug here, please apply if, you, um, if your student would be eligible. Um, don't let this hold you back because the more interest that we have, of course, um, the more leg we have to stand on next year to advocate for more funds to be appropriated to this program. So I always like to include that there. Um, so now I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into student eligibility. So what students will be eligible in the state of Indiana? So first, students will need to prove that they're residents of Indiana that they're a student who is, has a disability and requires special education and for whom an IEP a service plan or a choice scholarship education plan has been developed. There is an income requirement, um, which right now is the same as the choice scholarship program, which is 300% of the free and reduced lunch income. And the student must fall between the ages of five and 22 as of August 1st of the upcoming school year. Now, what does that income requirement mean? I want to share some updated figures with you. Um, here, you can see a graphic that demonstrates the household size and what the annual household income limit would be. Um, and thank you again to Department of Education for sharing this with us. Um, so you can kind of quickly reference this. This graphic is all, also up on our website. Um, if you don't catch the details now, um, but this would be the income limit that um, the families would produce some documentation to prove that they meet this requirement for our program. Uh, my student has a 504 plan. Is that sufficient for eligibility in this program? So at this time, no. Um, 50 accommodations that are in a 504 um, would obviously be it, uh, qualified expenses through our program, but uh, in and of itself, it would not um, prove eligibility in our program. Can my student use the ESA while enrolled in a public school? So unfortunately not. Um, when a student um, accepts an ESA or education scholarship account program, they're going to understand that they're disenrolled from the public school. Um, however, when you do accept an ESA, you're not locked in. So um, if at some point a family decides um, this is not for me, I'd rather return to the public school, they're able to do that and that would terminate their ESA account. Can my student use the ESA while enrolled in private school? Yes, absolutely. If a student is already enrolled in a non-public school here in Indiana, they can absolutely apply for the ESA. However, I do caution families um, to understand that there is not reciprocity between the choice scholarship and ESA program. So if you're currently a choice recipient, um, you do wanna make sure that your qualified school is accepting the ESA um, you know, in order to make a decision of if the ESA is a good fit if you wanna stay at that school in particular. All qualified school need to apply to participate in the ESA and be approved. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind um, when you're exploring those options. I would like to participate in the ESA program, but there are no approved providers in my area. Can I apply to be the provider of my child's academics and therapies? So two points I wanna mention here, at this time curriculum and curricular materials are not approved qualified expenses. And that may pose a limitation um, to families that might wanna educate at home because they would need to purchase those materials and those, that curriculum um, by another means other than the ESA. They're absolutely able to do it, it just is not a qualified expense under the ESA program. <clears throat> 
In addition, all therapy providers will need to be individually vetted and approved by our internal um, ESA staff. So what that means is upon application, therapy providers are going to need to produce a certification, a license or accreditation that shows that they can provide that service in the state of Indiana. Um, so that's why often parents are not able to be providers. In addition, for the ESA program, immediate family members are not allowed to be providers um, of any services or therapies in our program. What if I begin using ESA and decide I prefer the public school and I'm re-enrolled there? So yes, I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, we have a immediate data share system with Department of Education, which um, has been wonderful to build out with them. So um, we kind of share information about enrollment and disenrollment, which is very helpful. So if a family is choosing to disenroll from ESA, they would let their ESA coordinator know that information. Um, we would then go ahead and freeze their account, um, ensure that this is the choice that they want to make once they've terminated their account and they're re-enrolling re in the public school, um, their funds would be redirected um, to the general, uh, excuse me, back to the public school um, that that student would be attending. So any remaining balance would go then to the public school, would not be available for the family directly anymore. My student is currently enrolled in the voucher program. What is the difference with ESA? Well, there are four main differences between ESA and the Choice Scholarship Program that I'm going to go into, but one that I want to touch on really quickly um, is so amazing and so important um, is any unused funds um, that are have accumulated in the student's account by the end of the year can be rolled over. So families are not under any pressure. There's no use it or lose it system. Um, so up to $1,000 per year can be rolled over, and that's cumulative. And what I mean by that is at the end of the first year, if you have a thousand, up to $1,000 left over, you can roll it over into year two. Year two, you'd have that thousand and any additional remaining funds. So say um, you have $1,000 that second year, you're going into year three with $2,000 already accumulated. So that's a really nice feature of the ESA program. So let's talk a little bit about eligibility and the difference between choice and ESA. Um, under choice, students are eligible under eight different tracks of eligibility, special education being one of them, whereas our main focus um, for the education scholarship account program are students with disabilities who have an IEP um, service plan or choice plan. Um, and other than that, for the special education track and the ESA, the requirements are identical. A student would still have to prove they're a resident of Indiana, the same income requirement, and the same age range. Qualified expenses are perhaps one of the biggest differences. Um, for choice, the, the biggest quali the only qualified expense is tuition and fees um, at participating choice schools, whereas in the ANISA program, tuition and fees at qualified schools are just one, one of our many expenses that families would be able to spend our funds on. And I'll talk more about these different qualified expenses when we move into that section of the presentation. Um, but we do have those tuition and fees in common with choice. Application window is a little bit different. So choice has two application windows throughout the school year. Right now, for this first year of rollout of the ESA program, um, our application window for families is going to be June till August. Um, I don't have exact dates at this time, but we're anticipating sometime in mid-August that our application would close. And the reason for that is we want families to have enough time, um, say we've, we've maxed out our disbursements and we cannot disperse any more grant awards, um, we want families to still have a window to be able to apply for the choice program. So um, we're looking at a June to August. Um, application window, and that will be available right on our website. We'll be sending out notifications when the application is um, about to open, so there'll be plenty of notification around that timeline. Um, the way that the funds travel are also a bit different. So um, choice scholarship payments are made um, to the school on the student's behalf directly from the department. Um, whereas with the ESA program, quarterly disbursements are made into directly into a student's ESA account. Um, parents then would be able to log into our secure online portal to make purchases of qualified expenses to pre-approved vendors in our system. And then, of course, that scholarship award amount is the same, the 90% of the state tuition support and then the 100% of the special education or APC dollars. 
Now we're gonna talk a little bit more about the types or categories of providers that can apply through our program to accept ESA funds. So we have qualified schools, individual tutor or tutoring agency, individual or agency that provides services to students with disabilities, individual or agency that offers a course or program to an eligible student, a licensed certified or accredited service provider, and entities that provide assessments. Um, so we mentioned entities that provide assessments because a requirement of our program is that all students that are accepting an ESA do take the statewide assessment. Now, if a child um, opts to attend a qualified school while using the ESA, statewide assessments are administered there. However, if there's a different educational option chosen, um, we do want to make sure that families understand that they are so responsible for them having the, the statewide assessment administered to their students. So we obviously will have um, those providers in our space and will be a qualified expense. Um, quick definition here, um, just so we're all on the same page. A qualified school is a non-public school accredited by either the state board or a national or regional accreditation agency that is recognized by the State Board of Education to which an eligible student is required required to pay tuition to attend and that agrees to enroll an eligible student, eligible student meaning an ANISA um, eligible student. Can a public school apply to be an ESA provider? Absolutely, they can. Um, so even though a student may not be enrolled full time in a public school or public charter school while they're using an ESA, um, public schools may offer individual classes, extracurricular activities, um, programs, or anything that might be built into the child's IEP or service plan. Um, so they can apply to be providers. So for example, if there's um, a public corporation, so a public high school that's offering a pre-vocational program um, and they want to open that up to students outside of their enrolled students, ESA students would be able to pay, and um, that would be a qualified expense, and they'd be able to participate in that. How will families be able to find an approved provider? So this is a really cool um, facet of our program that we're currently in the process of building out. We're working with a software company to create a very large, multifunction, secure online portal. And that portal is going to have a lot of functionality. So first and foremost, it's going to be the place where both families and providers are going to complete their application to participate in the ESA. But in addition, um, we're going to have a robust search function for families, and that's actually going to be available to the public. So whether or not you've been approved for an ESA or have registered in our system, um, anybody who visit this, visits our portal will be able to search for our approved providers that we've signed on. Um, and families will be able to search by um, a name of a provider if they know someone in particular that they're looking to see if they've signed up for ESA, um, the zip code, the type of service that they're looking for, so the type of provider, maybe a category. Um, they can also search by any specialty that that provider offers. Maybe they um, specialize in a certain disability or they offer a certain certification program. Um, families will be able to search by that function as well. Once families have registered with our portal, which simply means you have a username and password, um, and perhaps you're thinking of starting an application, you'll now have the ability to favorite providers, which is also a really cool feature. Um, and what that means is that um, just if you find a provider um, that you're interested in through our portal, um, you'll be able to view their marketing profile, and that will have um, maybe a photo or a logo, some basic business information, a website, a point of contact for that business, and you'll be able to view that portal. Um, and it, you can click to favorite them, which means that they're going to appear on your dashboard the next time you log on, so you will not have to redo the search function all over again to find that provider. Um, the provider won't know that you favorited them. It's got nothing to do with starting services. It's just mere ease of access for the family. If my student is already receiving services, can we sign that provider up for ESA? And I've gotten this question quite a bit because some families are very attached to the service providers that they're using, which is wonderful. Um, but for security reasons, we cannot have families signing providers up. So 
what we would encourage a family to do if they're in that position is to let their provider know about the education scholarship account program and encourage them to participate in the program so that that, um, that provider can accept ESA funds. There is no cost to either families or providers for applying and being approved or accepting ESA funds. Um, it, it doesn't cost them anything to, to apply and participate. So um, they would be able to continue um, that relationship with you. Can providers charge different fees for students in the ESA, or is there an ESA fee structure? So no, by law, a provider, and that's a school for tuition and fees, that's any sort of provider service or therapy, they may not charge a different rate for, for um, students who are accepting ESA. Um, and the ESA program itself does not have a fee structure. So when families are looking for a provider, um, you're giving, you're, you know, you're visiting their website, you're giving them a call, you're starting starting a dialogue about what sorts of services your student will need. And at that time, the provider needs to be transparent with you about what the cost of their services are. Um, but by law, they may not charge a different rate for any ESA accepting student. What if I don't approve of the services my student is getting? Um, so we encourage both providers and families to remember that we're simply the funding source um, and that all um, conflict or issue resolution will have to be between the families and the providers. Um, but a, um, a really a safety that we've put into place um, for issues like this is that all services are paid for in arrears for services that have already been rendered. And what that means is, um, say a family is using a new service provider provider and they um, decide that they want to go to a certain BCBA. And so they go for one session and that provider invoices them for that session and they decide, nope, I don't want to go to that BCBA anymore. I didn't like those services. Um, they, for all intents and purposes, can leave at that moment. They don't need to continue um, receiving services from that provider. So we just encourage um, families to be especially attentive to um, whatever contract that they might be entering into with um, a provider because they are responsible for any services that are rendered, um, but they would not be able to use ESA funds to pay for services ahead of time, like any sort of package or anything like that. How can a provider apply to participate? So providers are gonna be using the same portal that families are, um, but I talk through this a little bit, um, especially for families to understand what our vetting process is like for providers. Um, so at the time of um, application, a provider is going to have to produce a business license and any professional license accreditation or certification proving their scope of practice here in the state of Indiana. Um, so that way families who are selecting these providers know that they've been vetted and that they hold the proper credential. We're also asking providers to manually enter their expiration date of their license or certification. And what we've built into our system is like a reminder um, alert system, which is really nice. Um, as a certificate, certificate and license holder myself, um, I know oftentimes I forget kind of who all needs to know that my, my license is up to date. So we're internally building that in for providers. So as a reminder, when they're renewing their license to upload the most current copy into our system. Providers will be able to um, apply in April of 2022. Um, and some of you might be wondering why um, providers can apply before families. Um, and that's because as a parent myself of two young children, um, if I were thinking of signing up for the ESA program, I'd wanna know, well, what providers around me are participating? Who, who will I have access to? And so that's the reason we wanted providers to start a little bit before families. So we have a couple of months there um, that before families will be able to apply in June, they'll be able to log on and see hopefully a robust list of providers that have signed on with ESA. Um, now we're going to talk about our last topic here, which is qualified expenses. So these are all the things that your funds can be used to pay for through the Education Scholarship Account Program. So we have tuition and fees at a qualified school, assessments and examinations, educational services for students with a disability, paraprofessionals and educational aides, individual classes, extracurricular activities or programs, services and therapies as prescribed, fee-for-service transportation, and training programs and camps with specific skill focus. Um, and before we move on to the next slide, I'd just like to touch on two of these in particular. The first one is services and therapies as prescribed. So I want to talk about what that means. Um, a student 
who is applying for an ESA will obviously have to have an IEP or service plan or CSEP, as I've mentioned quite a number of times. And um, that IEP, that documentation um, what, that they're bringing in to the ESA will have certain services and therapies that are listed right on it. And those are automatically qualified expenses in our program. However, um, I've gotten quite a few phone calls from families that might say, you know, for example, I've been trying to get occupational therapy in my student's IEP for a year now, and um, I just haven't been able to do it. So would that mean I can't pay for occupational therapy? Um, so the caveat to that is that a family can go to their prescribing um, physician, so their child's treating physician, and obtain a prescription for the therapy that they're looking to pay for. Um, if the treating physician has that prescription, they can upload that into our system, um, and then they would be able to pay for that service or therapy um, through using ESA funds. So it doesn't have to, if, you, if you've been trying tirelessly to get something written into your child's documentation, you haven't been able to do it, there is also that second way of being able to pay for those therapies. The second thing I want to touch on is training programs and camps with specific skill focus. So those are outlined on our website, but um, the specific skill focus means that it has to really cater to the population of students that we're looking to support for this first year of the ESA launch. Um, and those are skill focuses like pre-vocational programming, social skills, um, you know, different types of transition programming um, that would be offered to students with disabilities. So again, um, you know, any provider that's looking to come on in that space, um, just be sure to visit our website and look at those specific skill focuses that would be qualified expenses. How will ESA funds be given to families? So again, this is a great feature of our portal. So we're bringing on a second vendor who um, will manage our account. So when a family is approved for an ESA, they will um, have access to their grant award amount. So they'll know what that's going to be and they'll be given a link to um, open up their student's account. And that's not tied to any personal account or we don't require any personal banking information from the family. Um, this is a completely separate ESA say only account. Um, so the family will open that up. I also take a moment here to uh, mention that if you have multiple students in your household, so say you have siblings who would both qualify for the program, um, for ease of access, a family is going to have one login to our portal and then two completely separate accounts. Um, and the funds are non-transferable. So if one student runs out of money, you can't kind of transfer funds over from that second student. Each one is going to have their own separate account that you would manage expenses through, um, but we feel like it's a lot easier to just log in one time. Um, so um, ESA, so as I mentioned, you'll have your, um, your full picture of what your total annual grant award will be, and that will be deposited into the student's account in quarterly disbursements. So the family will know when those disbursements are coming, they'll be on a set schedule, and we're going to be very transparent at the onset about what the quarterly disbursements are going to be. If a family is choosing to attend a qualified school here in Indiana, um, we go ahead and um, do a big favor for the families and we prioritize the payment to that qualified school, that tuition and fee payment. Um, it's one less thing that parents have to worry about budgeting for. Um, I've had a lot of concerns from families, like how am I going to budget this money and how do I make sure? So we heard those concerns and really we wanna make sure that if a family um, wants to attend a qualified school and has that tuition and fee payment that's going to be occurring regularly, um, that we go ahead and internally prioritize that payment after the family has selected that school. So they don't have to worry about those tuition and fees. If that's the case, a family's, uh, of course, going to see that transparently. They're going to see their total award amount, what their tuition and fee amount is going to be, and then what the remaining balance is going to be and how that's going to be dispersed to the family quarterly. So everything will write, be right on the parent's main dashboard when they log into their portal. They'll be able to see um, the total amount, the quarterly disbursements, when a, when a disbursement has occurred, and any outstanding invoices that they're responsible for paying. Um, can these expenses be accessed virtually? Um, so this year, um, there's a limited number of qualified expenses that, that students will be able to access virtually, um, and those are educational services, occupational therapy provided in accordance with the IEP or service plan, and tuition and fees to those training programs or camps. Um, other than that, a, a student would need to access any other qualified expense in person. 
Am I limited to purchasing the services outlined in my student's IEP or service plan? So as I mentioned before, I kind of touched on this. If they're not um, outlined in the IEP or service plan, then you can go ahead and get a written prescription from your treating physician. Um, and then once that's uploaded into our system, any therapies or services referenced there would be qualified expenses. Can I pay for providers to come to my child's school and provide services? Um, we wanna be really clear here that that's completely up to each individual school to determine. Um, I've actually been asked this question a few times. Um, so say they're, they're getting a certain service at the school, but they're not really um, caring for the service provision there. They, they really like an outside service provider. They really need to have a dialogue with the school um, before kind of going ahead and paying for those services. You need to make sure that that's allowable um, under your school's policies. How can families make payments to an approved provider? Um, so this is another area where we've kind of taken a little bit of burden off the family um, if, they're, if they opt for it. So either the family or the service provider can upload the invoice for services rendered. Again, all payments need to be for services that have already occurred. So essentially, um, I know what I would opt to do as a parent of two toddlers is, is go ahead, let the provider upload the invoice because no payments can be made, no transactions can be um, facilitated without the parent's approval. Um, so even if the provider goes ahead and uploads the invoice um, for the services rendered, um, there will be no payment made until the family logs in, reviews the invoice to ensure that it's all correct, that the, the total amount is correct, and then they go ahead and approve the payment. Um, even after the family approves the payment, our team internally is vetting all qualified expenses. So we're then reviewing the invoice invoice, reviewing the payment made, um, and ensuring those match. And that's really, again, for the protection of the family to make sure that everything is correct, that they didn't overlook something. Um, maybe the payment amount is wrong, or there's um, an item on the invoice that's not a qualified expense. Um, so we just do a double check of that for them. Will families be offered reimbursement? Um, are there other ways to access the funds? Um, not this year, no. Families will not be reimbursed for any payments made outside of the portal, even if they do fall into the category of qualified expenses. Um, everything, the, the payment portal is really the center of our payment processing system. So um, parents will not be issued um, reimbursement with receipt or anything like that. Um, I've gotten this question a lot, and I love this question, um, even though I don't like answering it, but I don't want to tell anybody how to budget their ESA. Um, you know, it's about choice, and this is a scholarship account for flexibility and customization of your educational services. Um, however, I do like to encourage families to think about budgeting. Um, you know, I say the way we should all be budgeting our personal finances and prioritize payments for those most important things first. So really you want to think about what's the core educational service that my child is going to get. Is it at a qualified school, a different non-public school? Um, you know, am, or am I going to hire a tutor? What is that educational service going to look like? And then kind of build out from there and think about services and therapies. Um, in addition, that you would have the budget for after paying for that core um, educational service. What if an ESA amount is less than a tuition payment? Um, if families are starting off with their child in high school, this is a likely scenario. Um, families just really need to be aware when they're communicating with the, with the schools um, for, that are offering tuition and fees, so a qualified school or private school, they need to be aware of what those um, tuition and fees are in comparison with what the award that they would be receiving is. Um, so they would need to be prepared to pay that difference. Now, as I mentioned, Mentioned earlier, the ESA does not limit a family from taking advantage of other scholarships. So a scholarship may be able to fill that gap, um, but we just want families to really understand that they need to be accountable for that difference there. Um, if they're not prepared to pay a difference, um, they might want to look for a school that does fall in their ESA budget. Um, really, and that's the conclusion of my presentation. Um, I have the website here for you. Um, there's also my phone number and web, uh, my phone number and email, and I also have the email address for my coordinator on there as well. So, thank you guys so much.
Thank you, Jackie. That was so helpful. So much uh, information and detail. We really appreciate it, especially the Q&A format that you used. <clears throat> that was really helpful. So Emma and I have been tracking questions that have come through in the chat, and I think we have a few minutes maybe to answer those questions. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One specifically was, when should you decline the IEP and ISP? And this, this might go to Nancy, but maybe, um, maybe Jackie, you have a better idea because you had talked about the June through August application window. And so is the assumption that the, the declining needs to happen before you apply in that June to August window or, or could you clarify that? I think it depends to kind of reference Dr. Holsapple's presentation. I think it depends on if this is an initial evaluation or the student is coming in, um, you know, maybe that has an IEP already, um, because I would think that if they're kind of going for that initial IEP, and again, Dr. Holsapple, please jump in and correct me if I'm misinforming here, but um, if they're going in for an initial evaluation, they're going to go through that process that she had referenced. So they're going to offer that IEP and at that time they would decline it. Um, if they're accepting um, the ESA, but they've already had an IEP established, we're kind of in the summer months there once the school year has ended. Um, so if they're accepting the ESA, we're going to send that information over to Department of Education. And at that time, um, you know, they would be declining those services. So I guess it just kind of depends on the, the status of the student when they're coming in. Okay, so as a follow up, um, they can decline after they apply. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then this this question came in on a text that I just want to get in because I think all the rest will go through Emma. Um, and when the if a, if a parent acquires a physician's notice that allows them to access services um, because they haven't been able to get them through the IEP, when they return to the school, um, that physician's notice uh, is only relevant to the ESA. It's not mm -hmm. relevant to services they're entitled to when they go back to public schools. That's, That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, Emma, do you want to take over from here? Yeah, I can. Um, all right, so we had a question come in that asked if transportation to a charter would be a, an allowable expense. Great question. So no, um, because transportation would only be to and from a, approved ESA providers and because a charter is a public school. Um, it, well, I guess now that I'm talking that through, if the charter school is offering one of those programs or, um, you know, extracurriculars, so not for full-time enrollment, um, but if they're attending, say, one of those classes that I referenced or, you know, kind of an individual program, then, um, then it would be, but not for enrollment um, as like a daily transportation to school. Okay. Um, and then Nicole asked a couple ones. The first one is, do you anticipate a large amount or variety of providers the first year that Anissa goes live. And I hope so, Nicole. <laughs> fingers crossed. Um, and is the process difficult for the providers to get approved? Say that one again, Emma, I'm sorry. Is the process difficult for the providers to get approved? No, um, I don't think so. We're, we're building it out to be really user friendly. Um, we certainly don't want to set up any barriers for entry either to families or providers. So um, the documentation that we would be requesting from them as a business or as an individual professional would be documents that they absolutely should have at the ready. So a business license and a professional license certificate or accreditation. Um, and then from there, it's just some simple business information. Um, you know, that they would be required to provide us. So I don't see it being a heavy lift. And as I mentioned earlier, there's no cost associated with them applying. Um, the only cost that would really be involved in any sort of participating entity would be the cost of maintaining their own um, certificate or license. So for instance, I have a certificate and licenses in two different states and I have to pay to renew them, um, unfortunately, every couple of years. Um, but certainly that's just kind of a, a private expense that they incur. It's got nothing to do necessarily with ESA. Okay. And then Nicole also asked um, if curriculum for homeschooling would be considered in the future as a covered expense. Um, well, I'm glad you're bringing up homeschooling, Nicole, because um, we're very careful to describe what families are doing with the ESA as educating at home. Um, homeschooling is a completely different um, thing. It's, it's got completely different regulations. And 
um, if a student is being homeschooled, um, then they are not accepting state funds um, like the ESA, and they are not typically taking the state assessment. So um, you can visit the um, Indiana Home Educating Association website. They have much more information um, about specifically homeschooling. We are in the future hoping to get curriculum and curricular materials added to our qualified expense list for families who would like to educate at home. Um, but please understand that homeschooling is very different than what you would be doing in ESA. Perfect. And then someone from My Autism Ally said, I have a question about the treating physician prescribing therapy. Schools do educational evaluations that determine the child's need for accessing their educational environment, such as PT, OT, and speech services. So why is a non-school provider being allowed to prescribe services to an educational entity? Mm -hmm. It's a really good question. Um, so we understand from families' perspective that sometimes they're struggling to get a therapy into their student's documentation um, that perhaps they feel would be um, beneficial to their student being able to access some sort of education. And we didn't want to limit them completely from being able to access that. So a treating physician um, is certainly within their scope of practice to be evaluating what we call the complete child or the total child. So they're going to be looking at what difficulties that child has been having. Um, they're going to, I assume, be collecting some um, information from the family about why they think that this um, therapy or service would be relevant. And then it would be up to their discretion to be able to provide um, a prescription for that therapy or service. Um, and it's my understanding that that is typically a very um, limited prescription. So there's not, it's not just kind of um, you can go for a thousand hours of anything, right? It's it's pretty specific. And then the family would need to bring back um, some quantifiable um, progress and outcome data to the physician um, to kind of keep um, that service up and running under the physician's prescription. But that's a great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and then kind of along the same lines, Reagan asked, uh, therapies prescribed by an MD are generally insurance or Medicaid paid or less commonly waiver funded. Mm -hmm. um, and that you mentioned that ESA funds cannot overlap with waiver funds. How can a family know how to coordinate these benefits without unknowingly engaging in fraud? Okay, so read me the first one again, because I think you read me a couple questions there and I wanna make sure I answer them all. The main question was how can families um, know how to coordinate these benefits without unknowingly engaging in fraud? Mm -hmm. So how can they use Medicaid and Medicaid waivers and ESA? Yep, it's a great question. So you did touch on insurance there. So um, if a family is seeking services outside of the school and they do want to pass them through insurance first, so for example, if they would continue to have a copay um, through their insurance for a service after they pass it through insurance, they can use the ESA funds to pay that remaining copay. Um, as I mentioned when I talked about the Medicaid waiver slide, we are really um, guiding families toward their case manager or their coordinator, or whoever they have through Medicaid waiver to help them navigate that and be able to maximize both um, services. So as I mentioned, there is some overlap in the services um, between what's covered under Medicaid waiver and what are eligible or excuse me, qualified expenses are. There are some overlap, but for the most part, I think it's going to be um, there's going to be a clear difference. Um, I think there are many more types of Medicaid waivers than we have qualified expenses. So the family can absolutely get in touch with their coordinator through the ESA program who reviews their application and kind of guides them through the process. And in addition, they'll have the resource of their case manager through Medicaid um, to be able to in, in, um, ensure that. However, I will say that families cannot double down on the same expense. So you can't pass some, something through. I'll give you a great example. Last night I did a talk in Westfield and a parent is sending their child to a full-time ABA center and that's completely covered by Medicaid waiver. Um, so, you know, Medicaid can't pay for that. And then the family pays for it through ESA. A family be double paying, which would be super silly, but um, that, that would be overlapping on the same exact expense. And that's when they're going to run into that fraud. Perfect. And Reagan also asked, is it required that an ESA paid service be expressly listed in the student's IEP? Say that one more time to me, Emma. Is it required that an ESA paid service be expressly listed in a student's IEP? Only the ones that I've mentioned. Okay. 
Uh, Lindsay asks, if a, uh, sorry, if a child goes to a private school, but it is not an ESA provider, but still has an ESA account, would standardized testing fees have to come out of the ESA account? Okay, read that. I'm sorry, I'm such a visual person. Read that to me one more time. If a family is if, if family's attending a private school, but they're not an ESA provider, mm -hmm. okay, uh, so they're, they're paying for so they're paying for the tuition and fees a completely different way. Yes, okay. so it'd be okay. like out of their pocket. Um, okay, but they still have an ESA account, mm -hmm. and they still have to take that standardized testing. Would they have to pay for the standardized testing using the ESA? If you're at a qualified school, they they provide the standardized assessment as you wouldn't have to pay for that. There's no charge to the family. However, if you're not at a school that's a qualified school in the state of Indiana, so it might be a completely separate private school or you're choosing a completely separate educational option, um, that's when the fee may be incurred to the family and that would be a qualified expense. But if you're attending a qualified school in the state of Indiana, they administer the state assessment at no charge. Mm -hmm. All right, and then this one is from Mary Ann, and it's probably going to be for you or Dr. Holsapple. What rights and protections do students have under federal law in this program? This is a three-parter. Um, is there any right to due process or complaint resolution? What do parents do when there are problems? Um, sure, so I'll kind of speak to what we know programmatically on our end, and then um, Dr. Holsapple, if you have anything to add, please go ahead and jump in. So um, if a family um, is not liking the services that they're receiving from a provider or has some sort of um, conflict about the services that are provided, they don't fall into the contract that they've created with that service provider, um, they can absolutely take whatever means necessary to resolve that issue. It doesn't have anything to do with the ESA team. Um, they really wouldn't need to recuperate any funds because all services are paid for in arrears. So if you're provided a service, um, it's understand it's understood that the parent's going to pay for that service. However, a parent is under no obligation to continue services with a provider if they're not um, if, if they're not liking how those services are being provided. Um, and I, I don't know if there's um, anything else that Dr. Holsapple wants to add, but programmatically from our standpoint, that, that's kind of our take on um, a family, a family's um, recourse with, with services that they're not, um, that they're not wanting to continue. All right. Emma, I think there's one here that maybe Nancy could answer. <clears throat> it's from Mary Ann. Oh, you didn't read that one yet, did you, Emma? I didn't hear that. That was the one that was just asked. So, so yeah. So, Nancy, can you um, answer about, you know, what would be the dispute resolution if they, you know, basically have an ESA? Um, I'm sure that once this is all ironed out with our legal team, I would have more of a directive answer, but we're in the process of looking at the law, making sure it's updated. So I don't want to speak. That would be incorrect. Okay, so that's a good one that we'll table um, when we have follow-up information. Thank you very much. All right, and that looks like we don't have any other questions coming in. Do you wanna give it a couple minutes to see if any more filter in? Sure. Let's see. Mine says two new messages. <laughs> um, so uh, from Dana, who is a legal uh, support, there won't be any right to a due process hearing or mediation under Article 7. No federal protections as this is a state program only. So that's very helpful um, to answer uh, the, the previous question. Thank you, Dana. I will right, we'll give it one more minute and see if there's any other questions. Um, you see you have the, the contact information there from Jackie. Again, thank you so much, Jackie, for your time with us today. Um, and then what's not on the screen right here is Kim Dotson um, at the ARC is K-D-O-D-S-O-N at A-R-C-I-N-D dot org. Okay, I think that that concludes our session today. Don. Thank you. Yes, Nancy, do you have Brad, Brad Pendleton? Is there anything you want to say, Brad? Um, I guess I'll just kind of say, so uh, my role as a 
assistant director of non-public schools, uh, incorporates the Choice Scholarship Program. And so there, like Jackie alluded to, there's a lot of similarities uh, to that program. So I've been sitting in with Jackie and talking about that, but uh, sort of my role with this program and, and my team's role is we are sort of the liaison between the treasurer of state as they administer the program. So we will have um, in the near future stuff on our website as well. That will be the same as the stuff that's on the treasurer of state's website. And then we'll have a phone number and email if you have any DOE type questions that you can send in. And then if it's just a general question about the program, we, we can certainly answer that. If it's something for special education, we can send that to Nancy's team. So that that's sort of where um, I play into this whole, whole world that Jackie and the treasurer of state are creating over there. Thank you, Brad. Do you have any contact information or did you say that's forthcoming? Um, that will be coming. We'll probably have a shared phone line and email that will go out to myself, uh, specialists and things like that, but we don't have that up and running yet. Excellent. Kim, did you have any, any concluding remarks? Kim? I don't. So I just appreciate everybody's willingness to be a part of the webinar. Hopefully people found it helpful and useful, and I know more information will be coming soon. Yes, I've had a couple of questions of if the slides are available. Um, should they contact the speakers to get those slides or is that something we can put on our website? Um, what's your preference speakers? If anybody wants to contact me, I'm happy to share them. Okay. Um, and Nancy, same for the DOE slides? Yes, thank um, you. All right, thank you everyone. We'll be concluding this presentation. Um, best wishes. Thank you everyone. Remember there'll be a certificate available at the end of the presentation for those of you or a link to a certificate for those of you that may choose to um to, to do to use it. So thank you all. This concludes our webinar.